Thank you very much, um, Dushan, for the very uh, kind offer to come to Belgrade and present uh, this work, and also for everyone else who's been involved in the organisation. Um, so I want to talk to you today about uh, Canvas, um, which is uh, the syndrome that Dushan earlier alluded to, but I also want to talk to you more brief, more broadly about um, syndromes where there is the combination of central and peripheral or cerebellar ataxia and bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Um, and um, in a broader sense um, about the uh, traditional separation or dichotomy of central and peripheral vestibular disorders and perhaps um, some of the diagnostic dilemmas have been because some patients present not with one or the other but with a combination of both and I think this is a field um, that will develop significantly in the next few years. So um, my institution in Melbourne, Australia is the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. We had our 150 year anniversary last year. 150 years for a young country like Australia is a very big birthday, I think in Europe probably not. Um, the Eye and Ear Hospital is where uh, Professor Clark and his team um, designed the cochlear implant, which you'd all be very familiar with, um, and uh, currently um, is one of the teams working on the bionic eye, which is um, terribly exciting. All right, so um, the um, service that we have is called a balance disorder and ataxia service. It was set up to be a multidisciplinary investigation and management service which has neurologists, ENT surgeons, a rehabilitation physician. Um, we have a range of trainee specialist doctors who rotate through the clinic as well as um, specialist allied health clinicians including audiologists, physiotherapists, speech therapists. All right, so in terms of the background of this work, um, in the late 1970s, there were a couple of publications which described patients who had combined cerebellar ataxia and bilateral vestibulopathy. And really, in a sense, these patients were human guinea pigs. They were very interested interesting for the vestibular physiologists at the time, um, but nothing particularly um, relevant was made about the clinical value of these patients. So really it wasn't for some time later, um, in 2004, when Michael Helmagi's group uh, published in Brain the syndrome of CABV. So this was cerebellar ataxia and bilateral vestibulopathy. And I think most importantly, they described the characteristic sign, which is the visually enhanced vestibulo-ocular reflex. And I'm going to talk quite a lot about that today because I think clinically it's a very simple and yet useful test. So the VVOR, which previously has had a few names, including the doll's eye reflex, um, tells us that there is combined cerebellar and bilateral vestibular impairment. The VVOR will not be abnormal unless you have this combination. So it's very specific. Um, and physiologically or pathophysiologically, what it's telling us is that the three key ocular motor reflexes being the VOR, vestibular ocular reflex, the smooth pursuit and the optokinetic reflex or OKR are deficient. In the original description there were four patients and it was noted that three of them had a peripheral neuropathy. So sensation in the feet and legs was impaired. So the work that I was involved in really um, set out to establish whether this was just a curiosity or whether in fact this was a previously undescribed neuroidological condition or balance disorder. All right, so I'm going to step back now and I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about Canvas. So Canvas, as we came to discover from this work, has in fact, the bilateral vestibular hypofunction, cerebellar impairment, but also a somatosensory deficit. Now, the reason I use the term somatosensory deficit and not a peripheral neuropathy will become obvious because, in fact, we were wrong. It was not a peripheral neuropathy. Um, but that has relevance for what we discovered about the otopathology. All right, so let's first talk about the bilateral vestibular hypofunction. So 
Here we have um, the video head impulse test. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, here's a norm, oops. Okay, so here is a normal video head impulse test um, as shown on this prototype. Um, the red is the head movement, the black is the eye movement. Obviously, the eye movement is equal and opposite, um, but for purposes of representation, we invert that. So when the gain is one normal, it's easily seen black over red. Okay, so in bilateral hypofunction, what we see here is the red impulses and a very, in this case, a very low VOR gain, okay? So this is a bilateral vestibulopathy. What we see here are salvos of corrective or catch-up saccades. When we do the head impulse test at the bedside, we see one single movement. But in fact, the computer can resolve that this is multiple catch-up saccades. Again, um, this can be uh, visualised um, with rotational chair data, which is very flat, and of course the caloric, which everyone is very familiar with. All right, so um, after ascertaining that in fact there was a group of patients who had this CABV and a somatosensory deficit, um, one of the patients' bad luck was our good luck in that they died and donated their temporal bone. So we got the first temporal bone in a canvas patient. Um, and this supplied several um, surprises, really. Um, the first of which really was that it was not the vestibular nerve or, in fact, the hair cells, which were the primary site of pathology, but the ganglia cells, so the vestibular or or Scarpa's ganglia cells. And as you can see in this first case, um, they were reduced 84% um, compared to age match data. So this was a severe vestibular ganglionopathy or in the current terminology, neuronopathy. All right. Importantly, there was no evidence of inflammation or vasculitis. This is because there are, um, without harping on this, there are several other conditions which can cause a ganglionopathy but are synonymous with an inflammatory infiltrate. So the next surprise really was that not only was there atrophy of the vestibular ganglia, but in fact the facial and trigeminal ganglia were also affected. So this was a multiple cranial nerve ganglionopathy or cranial neuronopathy. So this, these beautiful images were prepared by the late sawmill merchant at the um, Mass Eye and Ear inf Infirmatory, and I'll just take you through them. So here we have normal. So we can see the normal vestibular nerve and the normal cochlear nerve. In the canvas patient, we see the normal cochlear nerve, but severely atrophic vestibular nerve. At higher power here, we see multiple ganglia, and, oh, I'm sorry about that, um, and in the um, canvas patients, we see very few Scarpa's ganglia cell. So it's very clearly the ganglia cell. This is really just to reinforce um, that it's not only the um, uh, vestibular nerve that's affected, but also uh, the facial and trigeminal nerves. All right. And at high power, you see really nicely um, the contrast between the vestibular um, and the cochlea um, nerve. All right. So the second component is the cerebellar. This is, um, again, the same um, prototype quantitative um, portable video oculography system, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, which we uh, adapted to use for central. So this does the video head impulse test, but it also has a central um, testing repertoire. So um, smooth pursuit, which is that function that follows slow moving um, visual targets in our environment, um, is tested here. And we see that the red is the head again. So the red is stationary because the patient is stationary, they're tracking a moving target, and we see here the tracking with very few low amplitude corrective eye movements. In the cerebellar patient, we see regular salvos of high amplitude corrective movements. So this is the so-called saccadic or broken up pursuit that we see in a cerebellar patient.
So here we have VOR suppression. So VOR suppression um, uses very sim um, similar um, circuitry, if you like, to smooth pursuit. Um, and this is the normal VOR suppression, okay? So again, very few low amplitude. Um, in the CABV or canvas patients, um, in fact, the VOR suppression is normal. Can anyone tell me why the VOR suppression would be normal in these patients if smooth pursuit is broken and we know they use the same circuitry? So it's a bit of a trick question. It's quite simply because there is no VOR to suppress. Okay, they have a profound bilateral vestibulopathy. So normally when, we, when smooth pursuit and VR suppression are discordant, we think it's a technical error. In these patients, it's not a technical error. Okay, so this is rotational chair data um, and here we see in a moment, um, the patient will demonstrate their saccadic pursuit. and uh, gaze testing. So here we see gaze evoked unbeaten astagmus, consistent with a central or cerebellar disorder. These are all from a canvas patient. All right, so uh, in the initial um, analysis of the canvas patients, we were able to determine that there was a specific pattern of atrophy in the cerebellum. So it was what's called regional. It affected only a couple of areas peripherally or hemispherically, and in the midline vermis, it had a predilection for these three areas. It was not global cerebellar atrophy, which may be seen in some other conditions. And then again, similarly, um, one of our patients' bad luck was our good luck, and we were certainly able uh, to show this pathologically. Interestingly, at high power, um, it's very um, specifically atrophy of the Purkinje cell layer. So in part I mention this because this disorder has a very specific pathology. It's not a collection of very disparate conditions. Just some more slices there, other canvas patients to demonstrate the specific cerebellar pathology. Here really um, is a range of um, canvas patients showing mild cerebellar um, atrophy in the specific pattern all the way through to more marked and by comparison a patient with global cerebellar atrophy. All right, so the VVOR, the Visually Enhanced Vestibular Ocular Reflex. Despite the complexity um, in understanding the physiology, I think it's probably the easiest test to perform at the bedside. So here I'm going to show you a video. And quite simply, these are slow sinusoidal movements while the patient looks at an earth-fixed target. So they can look at your nose while you hold their head and slowly move it side to side. And what you see is the movements are saccadic or broken up. For those of you, and I hope that's all of you who perform the head impulse test at the bedside, before you impulse the patient, you normally move their head slowly to make sure that they're relaxed enough. You are actually doing the VVOR there. So you're all doing it. Now just take notice of the eye movements. All right, so as I said, an abnormality of the VVOR implies that there is combined central and bilateral peripheral vestibular impairment. So smooth pursuit and optokinetic reflex are um, primarily uh, the department of the cerebellum, while of course the VOR belongs to the ear. All right, so we were able to um, collect a group of canvas patients um, and using modified, um, as I said, a modified video head impulse test unit, we were able to show that their VVOR was objectively impaired. So here we have a normal patient, sinusoidal head movements, red is the head, black is the eye moving together at a relatively low and slightly higher frequency. And then in a canvas patient, you can see these salvos of 
relatively high amplitude corrective saccades. And that's what we see in the video when the head's being moved and the movement is jerky or broken up. <coughs> so relatively easy to see at the bedside. Oops. So really this is just a, a warning for those of you, and I hope that's all of you who are now going to start looking out for this. We have a subset of patients who we believe are in the early stages of CANVAS or CABV, whereby the MRI being a relatively blunt tool, even at three Tesla, does not pick up the early signs of atrophy, but certainly clinically, um, and with a very simple ocular motor examination, you will pick up the impairment. So um, really, I guess the take-home tip is to trust your eyes, not the MRI. All right, so now going back to the original aim, we took a group of these patients where we confirmed the, that they had cerebellar ataxia and a bilateral vestibulopathy, and we wanted to make sure that they had this peripheral or sensory impairment, which at the time we thought was a peripheral neuropathy. Um, and certainly we were able to show that in the initial cohort of 18 subjects. Um, all right. At that time, we described it as a peripheral neuropathy, but we noted in one or two of patients in the early cohort that they had near total or global loss of sensation, and we said that we couldn't exclude a ganglionopathy. All right, so here's just another tangent where I want to talk to you about um, the modified video head impulse test equipment. Um, I think you will all be familiar and hopefully considering using this equipment at the bedside, um, I think what's important to note is that it's not only useful for peripheral but also central. So as you saw, we use this equipment and you can use any unit um, on the market as far as I'm aware to test for pursuit, VOR suppression and the VVOR. Now there's only one unit that I'm aware of that will actually log that data, but it doesn't matter. In real time, you'll be able to see it on all of the units. So um, whilst this is you know, called video head impulse test, in fact, um, for us in neurotology, it supplies a lot of information about central vestibular function and can help us exclude or include um, dual or pure central pathology. I'm going to move through this in the interests of time, if the computer will let me. We've been through that. All right. So just in terms of validation, um, here we have the gold standard um, 3D scleral search coil data. Um, again, the normal subject, um, the CABV patient. And I think you'll agree that with the portable um, video equipment, we were able to reproduce that very accurately um, here in a group of Friedrich's ataxia patients um, who very commonly have a bilateral vestibulopathy, of course, in combination with the cerebellar ataxia. So Friedrich's ataxia is one of the other conditions other than canvas that has the CABV phenotype. So again, the normal VVOR, and here we have a markedly abnormal VVOR. All right. I mentioned the specificity, so certainly um, patients have been looked at who have either bilateral vestibulopathy or cerebellar ataxia, and the VVOR remains normal, which is what we would expect. All right, so I'm talking about Canvas because that's my interest, but I mentioned that Canvas is not the only disease where you get this combination of central and peripheral. Now, a couple of cautions with this num these numbers. There will be an enormous selection bias because they're referred to us based on our interest, and so Canvas will be overrepresented. But certainly, um, there's every indication that it is the most common condition with uh, CABV. 
Friedrich's ataxia, as I mentioned. Um, there's a paper in Brain which quotes an 84% incidence of bilateral vestibulopathy. Um, then the spinocerebellar ataxias, um, particularly six and three, have a bilateral vestibulopathy. The thing to mention is that both Friedrich's ataxia, including the late onset um, form, which can present 40, 50, even 60 years of age, so these are patients that adult doctors will see, and the more common spinocerebellar ataxias generally have readily available gene tests, so they can usually be excluded, whereas for canvas we don't yet have a gene test. The other condition where we've seen a bilateral vestibulopathy in um, accompaniment of cerebellar ataxia is MSAC, multiple system atrophy of the cerebellar type. Now, MSAC, I think, is probably a relatively poorly defined condition and is not particularly homogenous. Um, and we've had patients with an increase, decrease in normal VOR gain. And it's uncertain whether that's because we're catching them at different stages of their disease, or in fact, it's a little bit of a bucket. And patients get um, put into that bucket, the, the designation of MSAC, but perhaps are not as homogenous as the Parkinsonian subtype, the MSAP. Um, there is a subset of patients which we've called idiopathic CABV, so these are the patients with no obvious cause, they clearly have this phenotype, and I suspect that they are a subset of the more commonly diagnosed idiopathic late onset or sporadic um, cerebellar ataxia. And I think that diagnosis needs to be um, subjected to a lot of suspicion, because within that diagnosis we find a lot of these diseases. And people who work in this area will often comment that they don't often diagnose idiopathic cerebellar ataxia. All right, so then there are a few less common conditions, um, but I want to uh, bring your attention to the combined pathology. So interestingly enough, we've collected a few patients who have CABV, but it's not a single disease entity. So um, one woman I saw had a late decompression for a Chiari malformation, so she had quite impressive um, cerebellar impairment. She developed a post-operative infection, was given gentamicin, complicated by a bilateral vestibular and she has CABV, but we understand why. She's not going to be one of these more exotic diseases. Um, similarly, a patient with a cerebellar hemorrhage, again, um, managed with a vestibulotoxin and scored a bilateral vestibulopathy. All right, so remember that I said we initially presumed that the peripheral sensory loss, the loss of feeling in the feet and legs was a peripheral neuropathy, but that we couldn't exclude a ganglionopathy or neuronopathy. When that first very surprising temporal bone result came back, it made us think, so if there are multiple cranial nerves, vestibular, trigeminal and facial, that uh, have a ganglionopathy, then perhaps we were wrong. And in fact, if we can uni um, unify the pathology, the sensory loss was also a ganglionopathy. Unfortunately, with conventional neurophysiological techniques, it's very difficult to tell the difference. So we had to wait. Um, and we managed to collect some canvas spinal cords. And they showed very clearly that, in fact, it is a dorsal root ganglionopathy. So it's the same pathology that affects the cranial nerves as affects the peripheral nerves. In fact, it's not the nerves, it's the ganglia, the small relay stations associated with the nerves. Um, so here, um, you see the dorsal roots. I don't know how well that projects with the lights on the screen. And in the canvas patients, the roots or rootlets are significantly atrophic. And here we see the atrophic um, meningeal coverings over the dorsal root. So at uh, high power, what we see here is a whole dorsal root ganglia. And similar to the um, images I showed you of the scarpers or vestibular ganglia, there's marked reduction in the number of um, ganglia cells. So for, for those who um, are more neurologically minded, this is 
the flip side of motor neuron disease or ALS. This is a sensory um, neuronopathy. So going up, we have secondary demyelination um, of the posterior columns in the spinal cord. So this is a secondary process. And going down into the legs, we see significant loss. This is um, electron microscopy of the peripheral nerve. So it may look like a peripheral neuropathy, but in fact, the pathology is in the dorsal root ganglia. Different patient, same pathology. That patient had temporal bone pathology as well, which was um, consistent with the first patient. All right, so now we thought that's lovely. It's great to be able to diagnose it definitively on dead people, but probably not that ha ha helpful for our patients. Um, so we set about um, designing a neurophysiological or electrophysiological pro um, protocol that could more confidently diagnose this neuronopathy or ganglionopathy in life. Um, and this was published in Muscle and Nerve. And what we did was combine traditional nerve conduction studies that are used to diagnose the very common um, diabetic-induced peripheral neuropathy and combine them with some cranial nerve electrophysiological studies, um, such as the blink reflexes and the electric jaw jerk. And certainly, we were able to show that there were abnormalities consistent with um, a global neuronopathy in that the uh, deficits were not length dependent. So of course, in a peripheral neuropathy, they're length dependent. Um, they start with the longest nerve, so at the big toe, and crawl their way in towards the trunk. And that they also affected the cranial nerves, which you would not expect th um, them to be affected in this pattern in more common peripheral neuropathies, such as a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. All right, so um, neurologists are very often criticised for being diagnosticians who then leave their patients for someone else to look after. So we thought we might draw together our experience and make some recommendations. So by this stage, we had 80 patients, um, including 13 kindreds, okay? So these were patients who had a relative with canvas. The um, pedigrees were quite shallow, they weren't extensive, but it certainly um, informed us that at least a subset of canvas patients was suffering from an inherited ataxia. So this remains the largest outstanding problem in canvas, which is identification of the genetic abnormality, um, something that we're still working on and uh, frustrated by. Um, but at this stage, we feel that it's most likely autosomal recessive. However, we cannot exclude a dominant inheritance with reduced penetrance. So multiple members of a pedigree who carry the genetic abnormality but don't necessarily express it. The other confusing factor is that the bulk of our patients are still singletons. They don't have any relatives who are affected. So in fact, is this the same condition or are they what's called phenocopies? And I suspect once the gene is identified that we'll go back and we'll find that canvas in fact is more than one condition, a disease and a syndrome. Unfortunately, this is the sort of slow and laborious process um, of identifying inherited conditions, particularly neurodegenerative conditions. Thinking. This is a very ominous sign. <coughs> All right, I might just... This cyber, cyber attack, yeah. Not, not one of very great value. Um, just while I'm trying to get out of that, does anyone have any questions or comments? These patients have clinically have yeah. a facial uh, um, policy or facial? Yeah. So the question is whether there was any clinical evidence of the facial nerve um, abnormality that we found on otopathology. Um, the answer is we didn't collect that data until we got the temporal bone. Um, information. So then we went back and looked at them. It's very inconsistent. It's not a clinical sign that I would suggest you rely on. Um, I don't know why the manifestation is inconsistent. Uh, 
Um, yeah, electrophysiologically it's there, but when you go and examine them at the bedside, it, it's not that reliable. Um, I'm just going to restart the computer. So any, um, oh, hang on. I think the thread of that worked. I'm convinced that computers are emotional beings because they uh, don't behave uh, consistently. Any other questions or comments while we're waiting? Jennifer? With the bedside device, where you had the goggles and they were supine? Yeah. Did, what, what other, did you have to bring a whole computer in the room? Yeah, the so look, th that bedside one was really, because that patient is so ataxic that he can't stand. Um, that's unusual. Normally we do it with a patient sitting. Um, and that was just um, infrared video oculography. The quantitative test that you'll see, you saw with the red and black um, traces, um, yes, that requires goggles and it requires uh, a laptop. But it's very portable. I take it to people's houses and take it into their hospital rooms and um, I don't know why it's not working. I might just take out... Can I take out that little USB? I'm not sure whether that's confusing it. Because it works fine on the computer without this. So if I escape and I put this in. Hello. <laughs> Mr. Smulevich. <laughs> Professor Smulevich, I have uh, another question. Yes. If you would like to answer. Certainly. Uh, it is little bit uh, early for this question, I think, because you don't say anything about therapy of... Yep, I might leave it in this moment. Uh, you don't listen to me. Yeah, I'll just do it like this. Yes, so uh, therapy. Uh, therapy. Yeah, uh, I'm coming to therapy in a moment. Yes. Um, so... After, after Maybe that. I'll move and if there's problems we can talk later. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right. Let's see if this works now. All right. So um, in this paper, which was published in the Journal of Vestibular Research, um, we tried to gather the um, experience we have with a larger group of canvas patients and make some recommendations. The first one was in terms of um, diagnosis and examination um, and... I might stop there and talk briefly about the therapy. So the first thing to say is that there is no cure. Um, the second thing to say is that my approach with all these patients, so all the CABV patients, regardless of whether they're canvas, whether they're idiopathic, whether they're free drugs, is that I worry principally about two things. So the first thing I worry about, of course, is falls and the complications of falls. Um, to that end, um, any patient who's at risk of falling, um, I order um, DEXA bone densitometry because I want to know what their bone density is. I start them on calcium vitamin D regardless, and if there's a sign of osteoporosis, then we begin specific medication. In Australia, we can't use the, osteopor uh, the osteoporotic medications without there being a DEXA diagnosis. So we have to wait, which is not great. Um, the second thing is um, falls and balance clinics or specific rehabilitation, which I'll come to in a moment. So the second thing I worry about is dysphagia and aspiration. So these are the two things that are most likely to kill these patients. So we think about cerebellar ataxia as being ataxia of um, what's obviously seen, the arms and the legs, occasionally the trunk. But in fact, the act of swallowing involves an enormous amount of coordination. And it's not uncommon for patients with cerebellar impairment to not only get the characteristic cerebellar dysarthria, but also to become dysphagic. And aspiration is always a concern. So I always check this with the patients and I urge them to contact us for a swallow assessment should they beginning any early symptoms of aspiration. All right, so they're the two main things I worry about. Then in terms of treatment, um, it's a matter of maximising um, the patient's independence and maintaining that as best as possible. 
These conditions, particularly canvas, are slowly progressive. So most patients die with the disease, not from the disease. Um, and from that point of view, uh, intensive, ongoing, specialised rehabilitation, we feel is very important. Now, in terms of an evidence base, so there's a pretty good evidence base for vestibular rehabilitation where there's a bilateral vestibulopathy. There's increasing evidence for intensive neurological physiotherapy where there's cerebellar ataxia. We don't yet have the studies to show what we do for this combination, but logically what we do is we give the patients both. And we're lucky because most of our vestibular physiotherapists are also neurological physiotherapists, and there is anyway an overlap between the two techniques. Anecdotally, this is helpful, but we don't have any evidence yet. Um, the other thing in terms of management with the canvas patients is because of the somatosensory deficit, they can sometimes suffer with dysesthesia, so um, painful or uncomfortable peripheral sensations often in the legs, and we find that that often responds to um, neuropathic pain agents such as uh, pregabalin or gabapentin. Um, we prefer pregabalin because it seems to be kinder to the balance um, system of the patients. Gabapentin tends to uh, increase their imbalance more often. All right, so I'm going to move on. So most recently we published um, suggested diagnostic criteria for CANVAS. This really came out of our work in trying to isolate the gene. In dealing with the so-called gene hunters, so the, um, the geneticists and the bioinformaticians, what appeared to be most important for them was a clearly described phenotype. So Patients who we could say, uh, you know, put our hands on our hearts and say these patients really look like canvas, not a little bit like canvas. In doing that, we actually subclassified um, the uh, condition. And I won't go through this in detail, and you can't read it anyway, but we have a poss possible, probable, definite clinical canvas, and then pathologically definite, which is obviously um, post-mortem. And really, it's a graded system whereby the three components, the bilateral vestibulopathy, the cerebellar ataxia, and the somatosensory deficit, are able to be... Um, uh, confirmed with increasing um, objective uh, information. So in the, in the first um, loosest criteria, it's really bedside examination, then it goes on to um, general testing, and then it goes on to very specific testing where we want to see an abnormal um, uh, VVOR on, uh, on rotational chair or the um, quantitative um, video equipment. We want to see the neurophysiological program uh, protocol used. And the important thing is that um, we insist that Friedrich's ataxia and the commonly tested spinocerebellar ataxias are excluded because we can do that. Oh, okay, so um, additional features um, which we didn't include in the core criteria but which are worth looking out for are, as I mentioned, dysphagia. These patients have a chronic cough, a dry cough, which is very interesting. So when I vi went and visited one of the families in another state, it was like being in an opera of coughing. All these adult siblings were coughing. And it made us think, actually, maybe the cough has some importance. We suspect that the cough is because the vagal nerve is affected, um, but this is something we uh, hope to prove uh, shortly. Autonomic dysfunction, so as with other ganglionopathy or neuronopathies, the autonomic function can be involved. This is particularly important in canvas patients because it can cause orthostatic hypotension. So the patient stands up and their head ends up in the sink. Orthostatic hypotension can be managed, often with conservative measures such as um, good rehydration, fluid boluses, compression stockings. Um, occasionally we resort to um, medications such as fludrocortisone. Um, the somatic allodynia or dysesthesia I mentioned, but this is really more of an annoyance to the patient um, and we generally manage this with pregabalin. What, what, what do they feel? So some patients will describe that they're in bed and the movement of the blanket over their bed is uncomfortable or painful. 
Um, some patients will describe uh, a sharp pain, which presumably is small fibre involvement, which we've certainly seen in some of the canvas patients. Okie doke. So, the differential diagnosis for canvas, no surprise, are those causes of cerebellar ataxia and bilateral vestibulopathy that we talked about. So again, in terms of the genetic causes, it's the spinocerebellar ataxias, particularly three and six, late onset Friedreich's ataxia, and then in terms of acquired, it's MSAC, um, Superficial siderosis, which we know has a proclivity for the ear, can also um, affect similarly the cerebellum, but it won't give you uh, the peripheral sensory loss. Sarcoidosis, rarely neurosarcoidosis, um, can supply a similar picture. And then, of course, again, multiple or dual pathologies. All right, so this was the slide I was looking for before. This is the management issues which we've been through. Um, I put this slide up really to show that I think the um, evolution of uh, diagnostic equipment in the area of neurotology is bringing us closer to simpler and more certain diagnostic protocols. So here really what I'm showing you is that uh, um, a bilateral vestibulopathy with cerebellar impairment, so this is abnormal smooth pursuit, gives us an abnormal VVOR. And if we have the abnormal VVOR, we know there's only really a handful of conditions. So we order the Friedreichs and spinocerebellar ataxia tests. We look for features that may be more consistent with MSAC. Um, and having excluded that, we're generally very comfortable diagnosing canvas. In the past, these patients would walk into the clinic and it was overwhelming. They were often given and still are given the, di the diagnosis of idiopathic cerebellar ataxia. Again, I think wherever we see that diagnosis, we need to be very suspicious. And certainly we need to check their VOR gain. All right, so um, in conclusion, in a relatively short period with a handful of neurologists, we were able to find 80 canvas patients, so almost certainly there's a lot of canvas around out there. Um, for very few neurotological conditions, um, has there been the luxury of being, able, of being able to display the otopathology and neuropathology? Um, and we hope that this will form a template for the further investigation of other neurotological condition. Following on from that, this work really highlights the value of otopathology. Um, and I urge you all, where possible, to sign your patients up for otopathology. I'm happy to be contacted. Um, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary has a program where they will send you instructions and organise for the international couring of the temporal bones to their laboratory. Um, and again, hopefully using this um, kind of work, we'll go on to find out new, neuro neuro new neurotology conditions, but also an expanded repertoire of conditions, which once identified gives us the hope of designing treatments, because we can't treat what we can't diagnose. I thank you very much for your time.